أسعد الله مساءكم لمن يسمعنا ويشارك في هذا المؤتمر بالشرق وأسعد الله صباحكم لمن يشارك معنا في بلاد الغرب أصحاب الغبطة الجزيلي الوقار أصحاب السيادة الجزيلي الاحترام الأساتذة المحاضرين الحضور الكرام أرحب بكم جميعا لحضوركم أعمال هذه الدورة مؤتمر اليوم His Eminence Cardinal Bishara Arrai. And his Beatrice Pier Batista Pizzabella. And it is our great joy to see the opening remark by His Eminence Bishara Arrai, who leads his people in very difficult times that Lebanon and the Middle East going through. It is the voice of truth and righteousness and embraces with his love and care the aching people, the oppressed people, all the Lebanese people. And at the same time, is the voice of hope for a better life and for a better future. Words of appreciation for his beatitude, Pierre Battista Pizzarella, who is as well came in difficult times that's guiding the church. With silence during the storms and difficulties in the Holy Lands. Dear brothers and sisters, we are holding this conference where there is aching wars that made lots of destruction and pain. The absence of solutions and destruction of people's dream, living in dignity, pushes for hatred when all these challenges, the role of the church is more important in facing all this, the evil that's raging in this world. Humanity is entrapped in the unknown and the fear that is in people's minds. This pandemic showed our absence of understanding of life and the contemporary human being seems like he's, he's able to do everything. And he lived in illusions And with all the advancement of technology that is unlimited, and the most important question today, is there an ethical question that all humanity agrees upon? We are all required to think deeply about this question with all these conflicts that's coming all over the world. Is 
And this awakes in the people what is humanitarian and ethical. And Pope Francis has said, it is a saying, a point to reflect upon. That is, I would leave now the speech of His Eminence Cardinal Bshara al -Rahi. I would like to greet first His Beatit, the Patriarch, Pier Batista de Zabarra, and all the participants in the 31st session of Alika Center for Religious, Heritage, and Cultural Studies in the Holy Land. I would like to greet the director of this center and all the participants in this meeting. I'm thankful for being given the opportunity to greet you all from Lebanon. To start this subject, building a culture of truth and love during time of crisis, the role of the church and its responsibility. This subject is the subject of today. His Holiness, Pope Francis, brought this up in his general message. We are all brothers, and especially in the fifth chapter, in all, all the church teachings, till Pope Francis, as well as St. Paul the Sixth, the Pope Benedict address the truth, love in the truth is the basis. I can say the world today is going through a real crisis and eventually a love crisis. Pope Francis says, Love requires the light of truth. That is the light of the mind and the light of faith, far from any relativism. And Pope Benedict, in his general address, the truth, love and the truth, without the truth, human feelings get devoid of social content and he says, for this reason, having an open mind to truth prevents love from being separated from the human and holistic dimension. Love in the truth is the basis for social love that makes us love the common good and we seek to accomplish it and to respect every person. There is no true people that does not respect every human being. This social love does not separate people from the individual. From this point, His Holiness, Pope Francis Pope, we are all brothers about the political love. These words could be utopic, as the Pope mentioned. However, politics as well is the kind of work that can lead politicians to sanctify themselves if they realize this. In this sense, we built the culture of love that Pope Paul VI called for. And built a new world in its structure, organizations, and legal systems. The world today needs the truth and therefore love. There is a saying that ignorance is a person's enemy. 
If I don't know who God is, how can I love him? If I don't know the value of a human being and his dignity, how can I love him? If I don't know the value of a country, how can I love it? Yes, the world is in crisis of the truth and thus in crisis of love. Here appears the role of the church and its responsibility, which is the subject of your conference. The church is entrusted to the truth and love. This is required and this is the subject of your session, that it spreads the culture of truth and love in times of crisis. For all countries, and I want to greet the Holy Lands. I want to greet all the oppressed and aggrieved people who are screaming for they want the truth. They want love. We pray with you so God can pour in the hearts, first in the minds, the light of truth, and in the hearts, the light of love. May God be with you and bless the session of this center and this conference. That is the conference of the church and textual theology. We thank God for the blessings and all the outcome of this conference that we're all in need of. So we can serve the truth and love. Greetings from the heart. شكرنا وتقديرنا ومحبتنا لغبطة البطريق. Our love and gratitude to, to his eminence, Cardinal Bashar al-Ra'i, and our brothers in Lebanon, and to all the people in Lebanon. The remarks now with his beatitude. Piera Batista, Pizza Bella. Thank you. Good afternoon to all of you. I'm very happy with, uh, to be with you uh, in this important panel. Uh, you gave me a very uh, complex topic, the role of faith in time of crisis, a very short time, five, seven minutes. I don't know how much you can say for such a complex topic. I try to to be as brief as possible to just points, flash, flashes, because obviously we cannot go further. First of all, I go directly to the point. We have to um, clarify what is faith, what is religion. We mixed up, the two things are connected, but also distinct. Faith is, uh, is a belief, first of all, is uh, your personal experience with God, relations with God. Uh, both personal and collective. Religion is the, in a way, uh, the institution, institutionalization of the experience of faith. When the faith has become collective, you need to create some uh, uh, institution to formalize, in a way, the experience of faith. Uh, and the two things, as, as I said, faith and religion are distinct, but also connected, obviously. Some, uh, and uh, the balance between the two should be a good balance. Otherwise we have uh, problems. If religions prevail on faith, we have a problem and also vice versa. And sometimes we can have uh, people who have religion but not faith. In Middle East is quite common. Uh, you can have also people that uh, they have faith but they don't want to have any religion, to belong to any religion. So. The two things are distinct, but also connected. Uh, and that are important uh, point to take into consideration that we cannot consider only faith or religion as an abstract, as a belief. I believe in one God or, or whatever. Faith is also <laughs> determining identity, both personal and collective, is history, is nation sometimes. And this connects faith and religion also to the political dimension. Uh, it's not, never an abstract. You cannot just, to, uh, to be Christian in Rome, in Jerusalem, in uh, Buenos Aires, it's not the same. The same faith, 
but is expressed in different ways because the faith is connected also to an identity, to a history, to a culture, and so on. And, and this also is important to take in consideration because, as I said, this uh, connects us immediately also to the political dimension uh, of faith and religion. <clears throat> Uh, now, to come to us, for instance, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, the religion is a very important role. Of course, the conflict, is, it is first and foremost political, about land, about the right of the Palestinian people to have their own nation or land. And since they are uh, um, prohibited in a way, till now, after 70, more than 70 years, to have their own uh, living space, where also they are born and so on. This is, Obviously, this is the first point, but also we cannot, um, uh, we have to take consideration that, that the religion is connected. I give an example, the political decisions, the political vision of Israel concerning Jerusalem is based on the religious, religious vision, and the religious elements. Uh, you cannot avoid, and the religious elements are the basis, are the main points to determine also the political of the state of Israel concerning Jerusalem and other issues and so on. The last conflict and the last turmoil we have, um, Al-Aqsa was one at the center, in a way, of the conflict. Al-Aqsa, of course, is not just a religious symbol, it's also a nation symbol, an identity symbol, but also a religious symbol. So, uh, and uh, uh, once again, the identity, nation, politics, and the religious element, they become uh, they are connected. And the religious element is the one that maybe keeps all these different elements united, give them a contest, uh, I mean, a definition. Here, the identity also from the legal point of view is defined by the religious belonging, for instance. It's not always the same in Western countries, different, but now I'm talking here from Jerusalem, and we cannot avoid this. Someone can say that this is not a religion of faith, but manipulation of religious of faith. I'm not that, I'm not always, sometimes it's the case, but not always the case. It might be possible that what I consider manipulation for others is, is the, exactly the correct reading of the faith that brings them uh, to their political uh, statements and so on. Anyway, this is not relevant. Whether it is manipulation or not, religion here enters, definitely uh, not only enters, is determining in uh, creating sometimes conflict or to be part of a way of conflict and uh, relations between different identity, relations that are uh, most of the time not simple, not peaceful relations. So the first consideration has to be short. Huh? The first consideration is that we have to find that the religious, one of the role of the religious leader is um, uh, to find the constitutive element of each faith uh, in, in our, and the religion also. Our religion, my faith, my Christian church, we have elements that now we consider that um, uh, necessary that uh, 50 years ago were not necessary. And 100 years ago, uh, we didn't think about. So we have to consider what is constitutive, what is really builds the identity of the faith that cannot be given up at all. And what in relations with other religions can be discussed, yes or not. And this is very important. Now, Christians, I'm, I'm supposed to be Christian. I have to say so, something also about Christians. Um, uh, the time uh, uh, in which Christians go out to conquer land in the name of the cross, in the name of uh, Jesus, thanks God, are over. Now the, uh, we are not there anymore. And for us Christians, the faith has a determining role in forming a conscience. The faith for us is not just a belief, but also a style of life, an attitude. Um, uh, we believe in the conversion of the heart. I know that in the role when there are conflicts, to talk about conversion of the art is something totally out, outside of uh, the context sometimes is, uh, is considered, but this is wrong. Uh, but so the Christian faith uh, is not determining in creating conflict, most of the time, sometimes yes, unfortunately, but is um, the main role of the faith, the Christian faith is 
form conscience, style of life, attitude, and, and this also uh, regards injustice, peace, way of building relations. Uh, doesn't mean that uh, we, we have to close ourselves in the devotion context, not at all. We have to be outspoken what is necessary, but with a proper attitude that is um, uh, directly connected with Jesus. The style of life is based on the life of Jesus. We cannot have other style of life. This is, and uh, the effort of the Christian faith is to, uh, to connect your personal life and your collective, the collective uh, life, I mean the community, to the life of Jesus, to, to the example of Jesus. I, I saw that, I see that I have to finish. One point, important point, the last one. The faith is determining information of conscience in giving you a vision, an identity, as I said, and to uh, make you determined, uh, convinced, strong in what you believe. And in front of that, there is no weapon. No weapon can kill your determination, your, your faith, your conscience, uh, your belief. They can kill you, but you believe, your determination remains, and someone else will continue. So, and the faith has a determining role in time of crisis and conflict, because the faith won't resolve the problem of the conflict, won't resolve any of the problems on the, on the ground. We are not uh, going to solve the problem because the problem of occupation with faith, but faith is the instrument that gives you the strength, the vision, the courage to keep working for this. The faith doesn't replace your commitment, but give to your heart the um, conviction, the strength uh, for your determination and for what you believe. And I repeat in front of that, there are no weapons able to destroy you. So I think I've used all my time. Thank you. شكرا جزيلا صاحب الغبطة وفعلا منقول إنه باللغة المبسطة. Thank you so much. And we say simply, may God help you in this position. I think the patriarch in Jerusalem is historically in the past and present one of the most difficult position in the church. <laughs> and now the message of from the church in a difficult world and that is in this world many things and difficulties can uh, difficult to count them but you realize them every day on different levels it's an honor to welcome Dr. Turaya Shalani, professor and the lecturer and researcher, Yusuf San Joseph in Lebanon, to Beirut. There's so much that I need to say about uh, Mrs. Thuraya, but I'll give her the time and briefly I'll talk about her. I love and gratitude for your presence. Good evening. Good afternoon, everyone and friends. I would like to thank you for this important conference and all participants in this gathering and for the Palestinian people in this difficult time. We always get always in prayers for you because his illness and patriarch. I would like to speak. There is a difficult topic in a little time. Please allow me. Should be like closer to the truth. 
and honest in speaking. These conflicts and difficulties that the world is living today. Churches, how they can read the condition today. in order to see now and the resurrection of Jesus. وتضيف الفقرة خمسة هذه كانت الفقرة الأولى أما الفقرة الخامسة فالكنيسة جهزت بمواهب مؤسسها وتسلك بأمانة بالكفر بالذات بعد أن جهزت بكل ذلك تسلمت رسالة الدعوة إلى ملكوت الله والمسيح فكانت على الأرض بذرة هذا الملكوت وبدأ إذا إن الكنيسة في جوهرها الفائق الإدراك يعني the mystery of the church the church goes beyond the time and space, it doesn't appear to the world, it doesn't incarnate in a certain place, and it takes like a special culture. Therefore, to understand the role of the church in this difficult world, we should look at the local church that is present here. The challenge, the first challenge of the church is how to read the, the situation now, the events. The church cannot see the events without seeing. Like the, 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 the spirit, what we live here today, Really, we're living in a time world of difficulties, geopolitics, and really to get rid of the Palestinian people and, the, and what's happening, what's happening in Syria and Lebanon. And this shows the politics of the UN and the governments and really controlling the condition of the people. Sorry, there is a mistake here. And really greed of taking people, taking the resources. And all these challenges because of this corruption that is present. For us believers, all these difficulties, it's because of the, the absence of God in, in the mind of the people. Who is responsible? God is calling, Cain, where is your uh, Abel, your brother? How to do for the people to go out of these difficulties? If the church received its message, really bring the kingdom of heaven so definitely it has a role to play what are the standards that we can without being afraid for itself the church but not afraid but thinking of others not worry of the church for itself but really for the others in reality, there is only these difficulties, but churches also in the Orient are influenced. 
when we see all the big challenges that facing the world today and we see the greatness of the church and its message and the big responsibility that it holds that is in the heart of God and for all people. What really is, is, is stopping this message? Yes, it's true. Sometimes this message was, I had like difficulties, but you are the salt of the earth. But if this is like affected, and really threatens its message. Jesus, as he said, when the salt is affected, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt is affected, how can it be done? So shame to those in the church, if those who, who will be influenced. The conflicts and the challenges in the churches and its institutions. Yes. The corruption, the competition between the churches and inside the, the, the one church. And also weakness in, in policies and general vision. I'm not saying that the church is, is having difficulties, but the, the children of the church will have difficulties. It should be the, the, the church of hope. We, we should see the Jesus who is resurrected. to see the message of St. Francis. And to give the, the woman the role. This is how Pope Francis saw the conflict. Allow me to remind that that the church in the Orient should work for this, to renew, to for spiritual renewal. And this is all important. Because of all the minorities that are really suffering and and especially the woman in the church, her role. And this is point so important that the church, either we can be together or we will not be. So the church, it's not Greek or assurance or anything. It is a church that came from diversity and the Arabic culture and the Arabic world today to incarnate the spirit. This is the, the common home in the Middle East. And in this one place, here, the churches can be with all the diversities. Really, the, the church in the Arabic world, with the, with the Arabic culture. Otherwise, it will disappear. 
we should really um, the, the, the role of the the church organizations really to develop and to to advance and really encourage the children of the church really to be involved in the cultural and political and social work in their in their arab countries so really bring bring the the, the values and then present with all the diversities, with the presence of the conscious. And this requires really the um, confidence in the others and really make a teamwork that will be really responsible and, and to make one vision of the church and public policies. Jesus has said, you are the salt of the earth. If the if the salt is, is this is in Matthew five thirteen. Yes, you are the salt of the earth. Thank you so much for this lecture. That gathered all the sides that are present in our hearts. Thank you. For your brave. to really advance in the church in this in the Middle East. Dr. Walsh, we are together. Okay in a special gathering. We thank you for your cooperation and we are grateful for the, all the efforts you're doing for our center and Lika, Dr. Thomas Walsh is the president of the Universal Peace Federation. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yosef Zaknun, uh, for pulling this a very important discussion together. And I am uh, deeply uh, appreciative and uh, have learned a lot from the panelists thus far. So truly, this is a remarkably strong uh, group of panelists uh, put together at this important and, and crucial time. Um, I'll read my remarks, uh, given the uh, uh, various languages uh, present in this uh, webinar. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be part of this important program. On behalf of the Universal Peace Federation, I sincerely thank Alika Center and especially Dr. Zaknun for initiating this very important discussion of the role and responsibility of churches in building a culture of love and truth during a time of crisis. One might argue that all times in human history have their crises, and to some extent this is true. And of course, the church has weathered many crises over the millennia. Nevertheless, insofar as we each live only one lifetime, each crisis has its uniqueness. This era of the COVID-19 pandemic is no exception. There's a saying in America voiced by some politicians that goes something like this, never let a crisis go to waste. In other words, if there's a crisis, uh, look for the opportunities to take political advantage of the situation. I am not advocating this approach. However, 
I do believe there are aspects of our current situation that may be viewed as silver linings, as in the expression, every cloud has a silver lining attributed to the poet John Milton. The current crisis is not merely a health crisis, though surely it is that. Pandemics throughout the ages have been very complex, broad-based disruptions, bringing death too soon to too many, and threats to life in general, impacting not only our human security at a very basic level, but also having broader social, economic, political, even scientific impact, not to mention the religious factor. In preparing, I noted that going back even to classical Athens, Thucydides reported about the impact of a plague on Athenian society. And to paraphrase, the catastrophe was overwhelming that uh, people did not know about the future or what to predict and became indifferent to every rule of religion or law. Uh, literature, you know, the uh, Giovanni Boccaccio's Decameron from the uh, 14th century is tales of individuals <clears throat> who are leaving the city because of the Black Death, and they are together and tell stories. <clears throat> Sales of Albert Camus' book, The Plague, in the 20th century, uh, have skyrocketed during this pandemic. Suffice to say that while the COVID pandemic is indeed a crisis, it has also accelerated and multiplied a wide range of forces that impact and threaten what may be broadly understood as human security. There's no doubt that the world economy has dramatically been impacted. Many businesses have closed and people have lost their jobs, their livelihoods. Politically, the pandemic has seemingly contributed to the intensification of polarization, both between among great powers and among nations and within nations, among ethnicities and races, economic classes. In the USA, this polarization is expressed in the deep division and hostility, in fact, that exists between the two main political parties. It is also manifested in the news media. Professional journalism has become increasingly partisan and activist in its orientation. Likewise, political polarization has also afflicted the corporate world and perhaps most especially the big tech social media, the monopolies like Facebook and Twitter. Even science itself is caught in the politicization. This reality also impacts religion and has presented or exacerbated already existing challenges religion is facing. Even before this pandemic, churches and even religions in general have seen a rapid rise among younger people of what are called religiously unaffiliated or the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. That is people who, when surveyed, are asked, what is your religious affiliation? Their answer is none. I have none. Some say that the nuns are the fastest growing religion in America and perhaps in other parts of the world. Complicating things further, during the pandemic, churches could not function as they have for centuries. As a result, services, Sermons, sacraments took on new forms. 
and the state or the government ordinarily keeping its distance from church affairs, enforced mandates that impacted church life, traditions, even religious freedoms. Churches were also impacted by the wider society's politicization and polarization. To some extent, the divisions became less theological in nature. That is less about whether one is Catholic or Protestant, Evangelical or Episcopalian, but whether one is Democrat or Republican, a Trump voter or a Biden voter. Despite these social, political, economic challenges, however, churches at their best continued to serve, bringing comfort, compassion to those in need. In addition, they have provided practical information and counsel in the midst of an often confusing, unsettling, and anxiety-producing situations. Churches, for the most part, supported the guidance of secular institutions such as the Center for Disease Control. They generally encouraged social distance, mask wearing, and encouraged members to help look after one another. Charitable efforts expanded with churches providing supplies needed services. Many churches emerged significantly as healers, educators, consolers, and voices of compassion and as reconcilers. Moreover, many churches, in order to adapt, entered more fully into the world of social media, social networks, and digital platforms like our platform today. In fact, in our post-pandemic world, there may be no turning back to things the way they were. Churches are asking themselves, where do we go from here? Will we resume business as usual, or will we have some hybrid or blend of the traditional and the technological? A combination of the church as brick and mortar, the face-to-face -face encounter, the human touch, the visual imagery, the architecture, along with the virtual and the social media world. Just as the corporate world has had to retool itself at this time, so too must faith-based organizations, churches, non-governmental organizations. Just as the printing press revolutionized Christianity in the 16th to 17th centuries, new technologies are transforming our lives. Of course, a crisis such as a pandemic also generates theological reflection among ordinary people, asking questions, why is this happening? Is this the will of God? Is it divine punishment for our sins? It raises these questions of theodicy. For many, uh, at a time uh, when otherwise questions of divine justice would not be considered. But it also presents an opportunity for deeper reflection on the meaning and value of our lives, our relationships with God and with one another. So in terms of responsibilities and the role of churches in creating a culture of love and truth, I offer a few reflections as I draw near the close. One, let us remain true to our respective traditions. Two, let us practice mutually respectful dialogue, just as we are doing today, both within our communities and between and among our communities and people of other faiths as well. That is both intra-religious dialogue and inter-religious dialogue. Thirdly, let us engage the world and the cultures of the world without imitating the world or losing the truths that have been revealed in our respective traditions. We must reject the myth of a war or incommensurability between religion and science. Fifthly, let us examine these questions of theodicy, 
of God's justice, God's goodness in the face of suffering in the world, underscoring the role of human responsibility and human freedom. Sixthly, let us become centers of compassion and healing, service to others. Seventh, let us always promote dialogue, mutual respect, reconciliation, and cooperation. The silver lining of a crisis is that we have the opportunity to deepen our relationship with God, to revisit our priorities in life, to reflect on the meaning of life and of death, and to prepare to die well. I close with a statement prepared by the UPF entitled, The Crisis in the Holy Land, a call for dialogue, prayer, and an end to the violence. As we observe the recent eruption of conflict and violence, sadly in the Holy Land, our hearts are deeply saddened. The Universal Peace Federation, through its Middle East Peace Initiative, inaugurated in 2003, has continuously worked to promote dialogue and cooperation among all stakeholders in the Holy Land, especially among religious leaders of the Abrahamic traditions. Violence and loss of life will yield no lasting solution. We therefore encourage the people throughout the world to join together in a call for putting an end to the bloodshed. Moreover, we strongly advocate for the immediate convening of principles from all sectors to engage in dialogue aimed at a ceasefire and ultimately reconciliation. We address this call to multilateral institutions and governments, as well as to the representatives of civil society, the private sector, and faith-based organizations. UPF, through its various associations, such as the Interreligious Association for Peace and Development and the International Association of Parliamentarians for Peace, will offer its services and full support of such efforts. Every life is precious. Violence cannot heal the human heart. Let us find another way. Finally, we call upon people of faith to come together in prayer within their families, within their own communities. We encourage interreligious prayer and dialogue for peace and recon reconciliation. And we trust by coming together in sincere dialogue and a search for solutions, we can take urgent and necessary steps toward a better tomorrow. Thank you for your patience and your attention to these remarks. Thank you, Dr. Zaknun. Shukran jazilan, Dr. Walsh, ala hadihi ar Thank you so much, Dr. Walsh, for this vision. That it has a lot of hope. and a lot of love. We move now to the next speaker. Dr. Maria Elizabeth de los Rios, Professor of Philosophy. Good evening to everybody. First of all, I would like to thank the Universal Peace Federation for this invitation and more particularly to Bernadette Murra, who has invited me, kindly invited me. And I'm very honored to be here with you talking about these uh, topics that are very important for our understanding as humans, first of all, but as brothers and sisters from one to each other. And before I begin, I just want to uh, extend that from Mexico City and from the Anahuac University, we uh, kindly greet you and we send our prayers to you, uh, to the people in Jerusalem in these very difficult moments that you are going through. I, I'm gonna share my PowerPoint presentation and the, the topic that I'm going to share with you very briefly is the vision of the church on medical ethics and human dignity. And what I first, uh, this is 
what I would like to cover today. First of all, the notion of person as a unit of body and soul. Secondly, the notion of health, sickness, and death in the Catholic tradition. Um, on the third place, principles of Christian social doctrine applied to medical ethics. And finally, I will just show some sources of information for you to later on check. And I can, I can leave my, um, my email as well. So very briefly, I will just comment on these four topics. First of all, I would like to um, say, because sometimes it is a little confused that uh, some, for some people, the Catholic Church goes against the scientific activity, and this is not true. The Catholic Church will always encourage scientific activity as long, and this is a very important statement, as long as this scientific activity serves the human person and protects his intrinsic dignity with no possible danger to his physical integrity or use as means and not as ends. Because for the Catholic Church, the, pers the human person is an end in himself and cannot be used for the accomplishment of other ends. Now, the first, uh, topic that I would like to share is the notion of person as a unit from the Catholic perspective. We all know that we all are sons of God, and this brings up the second very important notion uh, in this in this minute, that is the notion of human dignity. That is, it is because we are sons and daughters from God that we all have the same, very same dignity, and these is what makes us unique and irreplaceable. This is, uh, for us, it's a little evident, for, but for some people, it looks like our similarities and differences with others are put in, in, in our actions or in our sayings, but not in this belief, central belief that we all come from God and we all are made in his image and resemblance. Therefore, the person is a unit of both body and soul. So the body and the soul are not conceived in a separate way, but as a unit. This, from a philosophical perspective, comes from the monistic transcendental anthropology. And this means that the person cannot grow in his soul without the body, and the body cannot be taken care for without taking care for the soul. Now the body has a special meaning because it is because of our body that we become present in the world and that we become present with others. So the body is something very important in the Catholic church. And this is one of the main reasons why from the Catholic perspective, we will always encourage medical activities. Now this, uh, a little, image just to show that there we can um, from a philosophical perspective we can analyze and summarize the human person with two main levels the first one is the ontological level which cannot be more or less which cannot be damaged because this ontological level is where our dignity lies and then the second level is an actual logical level that is the one of our actions. Our actions can certainly be good or bad. Our actions can certainly be more or less ethical, but our human dignity does not. Now, what links these two levels? Our free will. And our freely, free will, it is because of our free will that dignity expresses into the world with actions which can be categorized as ethical or not ethical. But again, our dignity remains the same. It doesn't matter what we do. What we do goes to the axiological level. Now, the second uh, topic has to do with the notions of health, sickness, and death. Health is conceived in the most wide sense, in a very wide sense. It has to do with being okay and being well in the physical, psychological, emotional, spiritual, and social dimensions. 
if we fail to be good in the physical, then we're not taking care of the health of our health as an integral notion. If we are not doing very well in the spiritual dimension or in the social dimension, the same. Now, health is understood also as a human right, a universal human right. And therefore, it must be promoted. And it is our duty, everyone's duty, personally and socially, to restore it as long as it can be restored. This is as long as if it is possible. When curing is not possible, then we must go and switch ourselves to caring for the others. So health must be restored always that can be possible. The notion of sickness in from a, from the Catholic perspective, the notion of sickness of sickness, I'm sorry, is based on our bodily um, condition is based on this body that is uh, subjected to time and space, and therefore it can be corrupted. So sickness is the corruption of our body. But let us remember that we're not just bodies. We are souls and bodies together as a unit conforming human person. So sickness can also represent something good. We, most of the time we are afraid of sickness and we give it a negative notion, but we must remember that it can represent an alarm. It can represent that there is something wrong in our health, either physical health, either emotional health, either social health, mental health, etc. So sickness can also be linked to suffering. And this is a very important notion because suffering has a very special significance in our Catholic tradition. It can make us closer to God as we feel vulnerable. It allows us to share Christ's sufferings at the cross. It has a salvific sense when understood as a means of sanctity and purification. And it has a powerful meaning when offered for others in need. So not necessarily suffering and sickness are negative from the Catholic perspective. And death, this is another notion that most of the people and most of us are usually afraid of it. But from the Catholic perspective, death represents our entering to the eternal life. It does not represent the end according to the resurrection of Christ. It more likely represents the eternal life, which is nothing more and nothing less than being face to face with God, our Father. So there is no reason actually to be afraid of it, but neither there is a reason to intentionally seek it. We must preserve life in natural conditions. So we are not allowed to intentionally seek death. It occurs naturally and, with, and must never be delayed. And this is very important for medical ethics. I'm talking here about euthanasia. I'm talking here about therapeutic obstination, etc. So he who gives our lives is he who takes it away from us. And just uh, very briefly, uh, I will comment on some of the principles of the Christian social doctrine that applied that are applied to medical ethics. First of all, the absolute respect for human dignity by the concept or understanding it on the concept of totality, on the concept of unit, and on this very important concept of health as a integral notion that is confirmed with all these dimensions that I just talked about. So human respect, um, I'm sorry, respect for human dignity is the most valuable and the first principle that we must all keep in mind. Secondly, the principle of physical integrity, according to what I just said before, that it is because our body that we become present with others, that we can share with others, and that we become present in our, present in our world and can transform it. So physical integrity, this is what is most commonly understood as the therapeutic principle. That is that I am allowed to intervene in one um, part of our body if it is to save the whole. 
So the therapeutic principle comes secondly. Thirdly, the principle of free will that we usually call autonomy, but this autonomy has to go in a very strict link with the informed decision making. This is the notion of responsibility. And probably this is one of the diverse points of view with other perspectives in medical humanities, where maybe autonomy can easily be understood without responsibility. From the Catholic perspective, the church uh, will always promote person's autonomy, but as long as it goes hand-to-hand uh, -hand with responsibility. And finally, the principle of common good. We all know this is a very central principle, and this principle is accomplished by two other principles, solidarity and subsidiarity. Solidarity means the responsibility that we all have with each other to promote the best conditions for our human development. So this is among equals. And subsidiarity is to be able to understand who is in a greater need and give more where there is a greater need. So that is kind of the essence for accomplishing common good that uh, is, will never promote the person without the society or the society without the person, but will promote the unit between person and society. So I will just show you these uh, documents that are very rich sources of information in special topics at the beginning of life, at the end of life. There are many other um, documents, but these are like the main ones. I still have more information, but respecting the time frame that I was given, I will just stop my presentation here this is my email, so I'm at your service, and hopefully we can talk about these central topics for the medical ethics. Again, thank you so much for this space and my prayers with you. Shukran, Jazilan, Dr. Maria Elizabeth, ala hada al -isab. Thank you so much, Dr. Maria, for this lecture. مستجد ومهم جدا والقضايا التي تثار من كل النواحي من النواحي So for the last lecture, Father Dr. Ikal Haybi, Al-Khadamat-Al-Sahiyya-Al-Kalimalaka. أبونا الحبيب تفضل مساء الخير أصحاب الغبطة أصحاب المقامات دون ذكر الألقاب Good evening everyone all, all participants and all viewers and listeners You wrote my name wrong Edgar Malik I thank you for inviting me for this. I thank all those who spoke before me. There is kind of coherence between my presentation and the presentation of Dr. Soraya. As we are dealing with these topics like church and ethics from our view on Lebanon and the Middle East. 
Also, there is coherence with the uh, with doctor uh, earlier. We are almost in the same major, and we have the same like principles and common points that these are humanitarian and uh, like uh, ethical. There will not be enough time, of course, because the time is short. But I would say like the main points, Thank you for everyone for following up. I'll say the, the, the goal. It's a stand that is humanitarian, Christian, in front of all the issues, ethical issues, that the medical development is um, with the evolution, biomedical evolution and globalization. So we're talking about the medical development and globalization. We'll not talk about the bioethics. Uh, I will talk more about issues that's connected more with social matters. So the challenges of the globalization, the absence of the cultural limits. There is no more limits to the two cultures because of the globalization. Everything's like interconnected. The second challenge when there is no more these limits, an unlimited number of uh, like references. And the third challenge is the, the, the density of information, the, the, the big number of information and the conflicting information. The millions of uh, of data and information, and sometimes conflicting, and many references, and also the, the speed of uh, the spread of all this news, which makes it difficult to really specify. So the challenge of the uh, biomedical development some of like the, the modern possibilities. As we know, it's not only the pandemic of Corona. But there are many issues connected with all this development. 
والكنس بشكل خاص انما ايضا في موضوع جائحه كورونا ان كان من ناحيه ال التواصل من ناحيه كان من ناحيه العدوى when it comes to to connection and تخلص من الاشخاص الذين هم في حاله في خطر او الذين يضعون المجتمع في حاله في خطر و and those who put society in in danger and and talking about the vaccination if it's ethical or if it were used from like aborted um, so these are all ethical issues that need to be taken into consideration So all the medical matters we're talking about here. Genetical engineering. And if you go from a country to another country, if you don't have the certain vaccine, then you cannot enter. So all is this influencing like this, the, the society's relationships. Many, many modern medical interventions. So these challenges that that are ethical ethical issues from a social point of view and the medical in this time of a pandemic of corona so we're talking between the the health and 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 the social security and the financial security and and the spiritual security So there is a conflict of what is more priority. Is it the social or, or the economical? And when it comes to vaccination and we need to close the country and, and people need to be quarantined and what is the results economically? So when it comes to all the, the, the situation economically in the country and so on. So the Catholic Church and other churches, they took responsibility, but sometimes late to, to address the spiritual like security. Can a person physically feel like peaceful or in security when his spiritual side is, is in danger? So this especially when time of conflict and the social, socially getting together and, and um, helping the poor and the needy the solidarity, social solidarity with the poor and the needy. In our Arab countries in the Middle East, talk about Lebanon, and specifically. And I have to admit, I think there isn't enough when it comes from the church. It's not enough to speak about this. We should put for, for the poor and the needy, really give them material, really substantial material and financial economically to help. For example, when it comes to the PCR testing, 
we should really provide the PCR test to all people. Was there really uh, a justice, a social justice for everyone? Or just five, six members in a family would do the PCR? Will they be able, would they have the financial possibility to do the test in a limited time? Who helped to really provide this PCR? And where were the churches? Maybe that's not her direct responsibility, but it could really principle of, of uh, humanity and really should put departments for, uh, for the affected people in corona uh, virus in hospitals. How, how we are doing this discrimination among the sick? Is it the, the health condition or what kind of condition? And the, the, the issue of vaccination and also the condition of showing the truth and also the, the really saying the truth and the freedom of the of the sick person. All those who carried the virus corona were all like revealed. And the way it was revealed was not really like in a respectful kind of way. And the technical uh, development and uh, biomedical, we see the difference between the, the exact sciences and the applicable sciences. They were unclear with, 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 the, with the pandemic of Corona was really not clear dealing with all this issue. So in the Catholic Church, we have like a department that takes care of the health. And there is conf confusion, the concept of life or death. So here, challenge of limitations. So the believer uh, recognizes that there is there is limits and believes in eternal life. And there is also confusion when it comes to pain. So even if we lose our health, it doesn't mean we, we're losing the meaning, the meaning of our life. So mixing between productivity and efficacy, So it seems it seems like a, um, social and uh, scientific like benefit is is more important than the uh, personal autonomy of a person. Who's taking responsibility? Organizations? Is it the, the churches, the country, the government? These are all ethical issues. Concerning the Catholic Church, 
of course, with our belief. Briefly saying, especially that Dr. Elizabeth spoke about this, we believe in the creation that the dignity of man is in the image of God and also respecting environment. Also, the, uh, the human being participates in the creation and he's a co-creator with God. He asks salvation from God, but he has also his role But he has the role to uh, to take care of the environment and to develop it. Sometimes the, the church that really struggles between the conflict between religion and science We can see that the contradiction between the, the religion and science. Also, the Christian ethics doesn't refuse to work in these confusing conditions. Like some people didn't want to take the Eucharist in the hand, and this made many ethical problems. We, we know that we're living in a society where we can incarnate, the words has to become life. We should develop a way how we can listen to the person and care for the person. When we talk about the resurrection, we're always open to the truth. So in this, in this um, main thinking, uh, the conscious is is always the, the the conscious between the the rule and the and the like the the mind. Not only every believer, but every person how we can connect together and we should work more and more to really develop our mind, our, our conscious. But in some churches, for the church really to 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 develop and and continue with this development each christian is the icon of the the living uh, jesus so for each person either a priest or or any person um, to use really 
the, the culture and the, the development uh, for really helping the people and the and human beings. And in churches, local churches should really develop like a committee, like an ethical committee central for, uh, for these local churches. One ethical committee that really teaches the teachers of the church and not every church or everyone that So they'll be like contradicting to each other. So when there are many initiatives, then there is a confusion. So practical examples for the message is the, the role of the family first. We always say this is very important and the personal company and uh, really establishing centers, uh, really specialized. There is uh, many like specializations that really church should really like develop. And to put to put in it really the spirit of human being like Jesus taught us. And I call for consolidation together, not just with words and talking, but practically. So I call for really developing transparency and financially and, and really um, evaluation, making proper evaluation. We don't know how we, we deal with our financial matters and we don't know how we can and stand together and most important we are we have really lack of transparency either financial management everyone should be accountable also awakening we should do concerning the families and we should uh, celebrate the day, a day of life and the day of the sick and day of the elderly and all the teaching, different teachings. And I want to end. We should, we should choose one of the two when it comes to this medical development either the challenge, all this philosophical and social and political, which is the challenge. We have this pride of a God and the other, and there is like enmity with, with the environment, with others. So we have to renew this grace in us, be, be um, humble in front of God and in front of the others and uh, in front of ourselves and to walk with God. And thank you for listening. Shukran. Shukran, Abuna. Laqad afraytana fi adal masa. Thank you, Father. And you addressed many questions from many levels of life. 
and ethical issues. We have about 20 minutes. I will leave time for some comments and add questions and the final words with his beatitude. She will read the most important comments and questions. Thank you for all the speakers. To all panelists, should politics and religion be kept separate? Would it be helpful to have a religious council with representatives of different religions to guide politicians? Who would like to answer on this question, please? Uh, I, I could say something to begin. I, I think if I understood the question, it's about how religious leaders can better guide political leaders. And, you know, I think uh, that can be very important to even some of the presentations uh, we've just heard from uh, Dr. Maria Elizabeth de los uh, Uriarte and uh, Father Dr. El Haibi and others. I think these are forms of education, reminding uh, the, the leaders of government of important moral and spiritual principles. Uh, at the same time, many leaders in government are themselves very deeply uh, religious and uh, People, So I think we shouldn't overstate that the religious alone are experts who guide political leaders who are not aware of these issues. So I think the principle, as I see, is dialogue and mutually respectful collaboration, which includes um, sharing insights, wisdom from the religious traditions uh, and also learning from others. And to conclude, what delegitimizes the voice of people of faith so often is our own disunity with one another, that it somehow undermines our credibility. Uh, it's often unfair or overstated, but yet it remains one of the burdens that religion has based on uh, weak points in our history. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. So there's another question uh, from Mr. Paul Herman to all panelists. How about, he's asking, how about arranging a regular meeting in Jerusalem on a Friday in a mosque or on Saturday in a synagogue? and um, in a church on Sunday, where peace based on interdependence, mutual prosperity and universal shared values are discussed and available online with super religious leaders of these three faiths to be in attendance in good number to each meeting. I will answer that if you allow me. We seek always what is the best. I said in my word, 
not the gatherings and not the gatherings and not the prayers together. They're all important at this moment. Focus to find solutions, practical, fair, so peace will come in this land. My experience, 14 years in education and philosophy and ethics and others in a Palestinian university. It appears to us something basic, no peace without justice. I know justice without love and no love without forgiveness. When all this is, is accomplished, then everyone can gather. There are many and all initiative, we leave it for the right time and the right place. Thank you. Uh, from Mr. Wayne uh, Hankins to all panelists, the book has taught us that the fall of man in the garden so long ago and the source of all our problems is the source of all our problems. All religions have come after the fall, yet we are all far from creating the world of God's original intent. What is missing? What needs to be done? Dr. Maria, please. Thank you. I'm not sure that I can uh, address that question exactly, but uh, there's one idea that I want to share with you. I think we have spent too much time in the political arena and sometimes in the ethical arena um, pointing out our differences, but we have forgotten that that is not the way for unity. The way for unity has to do with pointing out what brings us together, not separated, but together. Sure. So um, highlighting concepts and notions like human dignity, I think that's, that's a way to start changing. And that's a way to start addressing, not focusing on what differences us, brings us together. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Elizabeth. Thank Next. you. So um, there's a question here from Hassan Muhammad. What is the best practices to build trust between faith communities so far? Uh, well, I'll say, I'll say something to that uh, very good question. Uh, it's, a, it's nothing that you don't already know very well, but I think it is, is sincere dialogue and uh, talking to one another. And it's not just talking, it's also listening. So dialogue is, is speaking and, and listening. So that, and, and with an openness to learn. Um, and that kind of dialogue has a result or an outcome when it's sincere and constructive and open, it leads to a kind of newer understanding or some step up in our understanding. And most often some kind of newer uh, respect for the dialogue partner, uh, some appreciation that wasn't there before. And then on that foundation, uh, there are uh, opportunities for cooperation. And the final thing I'd say, and it goes back to the other question about doctrines of the fall or theology of, of uh, sin or the fallenness or brokenness of human beings. Uh, although that's a, a negative aspect of theology, it, it is an effort to explain why there is so much suffering. It also leads to what Dr. Zachman said, that why do we believe in, for example, forgiveness? That, yes, peace 
requires justice and justice requires love and love all of them require a capacity for forgiveness. One reason for forgiveness is to recognize our own limitations, our finitude and our fallenness uh, so that um, when we bring that factor in, I think it opens up opportunities for dialogue to be more successful and productive. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Another question from Mr. Peter Davids. He's asking about the ways to... Abuna, Abuna, it got the job, you see? Concerning the relationship between religion. This is a master of students, uh, both Christians and Muslims. from different denominations and different countries, from Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, Iran, and Sudan, and so on. In the same class, and we are two professors in the same class, and there is a Christian professor and a, and a Muslim professor. There were many summaries, but there is one that I give. There is like ethical dialogue, the dialogue for Muslim and Christian without saying the details. We tell the students how they can read the context and understand from like the values and concepts in some of the work of the students, how the, the Muslim speaks to the Muslim. Like how we can see how the Muslim can read the Quran and how he speaks really amazing in the values in Islam and in Christianity. I think we are really like really making like incredible things. In order to be this love, there should be an environment of peace. There should be a culture of peace. And to build a culture of peace, we have to, on the, our universities and on our schools, before we work in our societies and in our uh, policies. Thank you. How we can live the, the, the Holy Spirit in our everyday life. I will take some of the comments. Dr. Ramsey. Uh, Dr. Jana Tomori has come on, commented that religion, science, and culture, uh, and where is there, uh, where there is religion, uh, not the tradition, remains points of conflict, as she knows. Uh, 
Another uh, comment from uh, uh, Mr. and Dr. Bernard Sabella. He says that in the Middle East, the church has become a minority church, unfortunately, but it remains a yeast. But much work and witness is needed to ferment the needed transformation forward. Thank you. That's it. Mm. Okay. Shukran, uh, Jazeela. Uh, Thank Atro you very much. I will leave now the words. Okay. Okay. I'll speak in English. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think, you know, um, St. Jerome has uh, said once the ship sails and the Holy Spirit guides it, we never know to which shore it lands. And this is exactly what has happened in this webinar. I'm really very impressed by this strong and outstanding webinar where I've learned a lot and we have benefit, benefited others. I really am very appreciative that we are speaking about a culture of peace. I remember in one of his encyclical, Pope John Paul II wrote about that the church should promote a culture of peace and that culture of peace should also be a culture of love, a culture of truth. And I'm really appreciative that Pope Francis spoke about the political love. Because in, in politics, there is no love, there are interests. And it's good to remind the politicians and the church that the interest is not more important. It's more important to have a political love, that we can really love each other, even if we have differences and disagreements and conflicts. And that's really a big problem. I think, you know, if I want to summarize that one of the issues that has come all through the speakers and the panelists is dignity, the dignity of human being. And the dignity of human being is God-given dignity. It's not political given dignity because we were created in the image of God, men and women alike, every nation. And this dignity drives us in our world to be a salt in the world, a yeast. Bernard Sabella spoke, we are a minority church in the Middle East, but we don't have the complex of minority. We live, we, we live in our societies as salt and yeast, but we don't live in a ghetto because we are an integral part of our societies. And in these words, I really would like to thank all of you, especially all the panelists, and I want to mention them one by one, His Eminence, Cardinal Patriarch Rai. I'm really appreciative. He is, he has been speaking truth to power in love. And he had paid, you know, a big price for it when he spoke on neutrality of Lebanon. He had paid a big price and he was attacked, but he never gave in and he continued. And as much as you Lebanese people are with us in Palestine, as much as we are with you, and we pray that you can solve your political problem. I also thank Patriarch Pizza Bala for his for, uh, for reminding us how faith drives us in this world. I also thank Dr. Thuraya, whom I know quite well, and I work with her in the Middle East Council of Churches. She has always a vision for the church. Also, I thank Dr. Maria Elizabeth de Royos, thank you that giving us your wisdom from Mexico. We really appreciate it. And I hope that we can really meet in person 
Of course, we would like to welcome all of you to Jerusalem, including our Lebanese brothers and sisters. And also, I would like to thank also, you know, Father Dr. Edgar for also illuminating us on all these things. But also, there are those people who we don't see, they did not really make the panelists, who have really worked very hard, you see, in order that we get such an outstanding, you know, a webinar. I would like to thank, first of all, I would like to thank Merkez al Liqa al Liqa Center, headed by, you know, um, um, Dr. Uh, Yusuf Zaknoun, whom you have met and you have heard him. And of course, also uh, Miss Bernadette Murra, the coordinator of our programs. I would like also to thank, you know, uh, the UPF, United Peace Federation. Um, headed by Dr. Thomas Walsh, who is my friend, good friend. And uh, for all your staff who are with you, I, cannot, I, can, I don't dare to name them one by one. All the technicians, all the translators that you have provided, that you, you have really contributed to the success of this uh, webinar. And really, we are very appreciative and we hope that we can cooperate more on these, you know, because I know local theology and interfaith dialogue is on the heart of the UP UPF as it's on the heart of al -Liqa. So we share the same values. I think, you know, these are my words. I know my time is also limited. And, you know, it's a danger when you give a bishop to speak, they never end. And this is the history, and Thuraya knows it very well, you know. But, you know, we are really very appreciative that we can meet in a webinar. We hope we could have hosted you in Jerusalem. But, you know, and we know the difficulties, not only of COVID-19, but there are other political, especially for our Lebanese sisters and brothers. We can come to you, but maybe not now. But in future, we can meet together and hold such a seminar together, face by face, because I always say, you can love the other on the computer and on the machines, but you can never produce children. For this reason, we have to meet to and, face and have such conferences. May I give the blessings in Arabic? Yubarikukum al wa yahrusukum, alaykum wa arhamukum. يرفع الرواج عليكم ويمنحكم سلاما أبديا باسم الآب والابن والروح القدس آمين God bless you and thank you جزيلا للجميع إلى أقرب لقاء محبتنا وشكرنا ودعائنا نتواصل أيضا في الأيام القادمة مع الإخوة and we'll keep in touch with all the present and hopefully the next conference will be face to face hopefully thank you dr thomas thank you thank you dr zagnan thank you beautiful program but a beautiful panel of people thank you thank you allah ma'akum shukran